Hello, welcome to the AC Solar Sections live stream event. Today, Russell Cockman, the Section Director for the ASV Solar Section, is going to show us uh, some recorded images of the sun because the clouds have come back. Uh, the cloud, they're keeping our equipment at bay. Uh, we can't risk having this equipment out in the, uh, in the weather if the rain hits. Uh, so we've got some pre-recorded images from earlier this week that Russell is going to show us. So if you have any questions, please put them in the comments section and uh, we'll be able to answer them. Russell, welcome aboard uh, and thank you for bringing you. the sun into our homes today. My pleasure. Thank you. Now, the floor is yours. Okie dokie. So hi, everyone. Uh, lovely to uh, have you join us. And um, yep, I'm, uh, I'm Russ and just getting started up. So please bear with us if we have any technical issues <laughs> during this live stream. Um, this is just a uh, fascinating way to do it. And I, I trust you're all keeping well under the uh, circumstances. So uh, let's make a start. So here's our beautiful sun, our star. A, a typical view of how we might see it through the ASV's uh, solar telescope. So today we're going to be observing the sun. That's me, Russ Cockman, Solar Section Director. There's my email, solar at asv.org.au. Now I've been Solar Section Director since 2013. That's uh, seven years now and I must be almost due for long service leave. Ha uh ha. -huh. But I have to say I, I've learned so much about the sun uh, during that time and it's just been wonderful to share that information with others and that's what ASV is all about uh, showing others uh, things that they might uh, that you might not otherwise uh, have the opportunity to uh, look at and uh, learning shared learning it's a wonderful uh, place to learn the ASV But a word of warning, observing the sun can be dangerous. To prevent permanent damage to the eyes, only observe through correctly filtered equipment. So in, in other words, the corollary of that is if you're not sure about whether it's safe to observe the sun through a piece of equipment, don't do it. What do they say, Russell? You've got two chances to look at the sun through incorrect equipment, your left eye and your right eye? Exactly so, yes. And that damage is permanent. It will not heal. So please, no. it is very dangerous to observe the sun. So if you have any, uh, if you have any doubts about whether the equipment is safe to do so, then don't do it. Seek um, knowledgeable advice, professional advice, for example, from myself or other knowledgeable people around. So this is the ASV's uh, solar telescope. It's a, a beautiful piece of equipment, state of the art. As you can see here, it's uh, here's the telescope, four inches in diameter. Uh, got a focal length of um, about 700 millimeters. It's on a, a sturdy mount, which is polar aligned. So that's uh, due south from uh, from my balcony here in Elwood. Uh, polar aligned, tracking uh, tracking the sun. Here's the video camera at the end with a couple of USB cables coming into my laptop. Of course, this is, uh, this is inside, <laughs> not outside. So the video stream uh, will, uh, will come onto the laptop and I could play around with it, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, it doesn't look particularly whiz bang from, uh, from the outside. All the secrets to its um, Efficacy as a solar telescope is internal. So uh, just looking down the front of the uh, objective glass, you can see down, uh, down the end here, this little, little red uh, disc, little red area here. So that is really the heart of the solar telescope. And it's really, it is not just a, a filter that uh, gets rid of sunlight. It's a very, very special optical device called an etalon, which, is designed to get rid of all that brilliant sunlight and only allow a certain wavelength of sunlight through. And that particular wavelength of sunlight is what we call hydrogen alpha. It's the red light of hydrogen at a wavelength of 656 
nanometers. That's deep into the red spectrum of light, almost getting to the limits of what our eyes can see. And that's the uh, important part of the telescope here. This ethylon that uh, separates out the, um, the red light of hydrogen from all the other light. But because of the design, it does allow heat to get through. Now, it's, it's actually the heat when it's focused on the eye that does the damage to the retina. So although we can't see it very, very well here, but at the end of the, uh, the telescope in the, uh, the draw tube is what we call an IR block. So it blocks out all of the, uh, in, the damaging infrared, all the heat. So what passes through the telescope to the eye or to the camera is this hydrogen alpha light, and it is uh, perfectly safe to observe with the eye. Now, uh, I have to also say that the uh, camera is a monochrome camera, meaning it only shows shades of gray. Um, reason for that is that it improves the resolution of uh, the camera, etc., etc. So the the video stream that I'll be showing today is only shades of grey, <clears throat> but I can add the uh, the colours later on. But before we actually have a look at some videos of the sun, I think it's very very important just to recap about what the sun actually is. Uh, um, so what what is it what is it <laughs> what we're actually looking at? So our sun is a star. One of uh, those several uh, hundred billion of, of stars that are present in our Milky Way galaxy. And stars are massive balls of very hot gas, in brackets, plasma, that shines by fusion of hydrogen into helium in its core. The sun is massive. It contains 99.9% .9 of the solar system's mass. So everything else, the planets, the asteroids, the Earth, us, Comets, etc., comprise only 0.1% of the solar system's mass, as far as we know. It formed a long time ago, 4,600 million years ago, from a nebula of, of gas and dust. It, the sun is big. It's close to 1.4 million kilometers in diameter. Now, today's late, today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be confronting you with some large numbers. I have, no, I have no apologies for that because the universe is big and we need to be comfortable with big numbers to uh, appreciate just how big the universe is and really how small and insignificant you and I are. But that 1.4 million kilometres in diameter, that is 109 Earth diameters, to put it into context. So when we look at the sun through a telescope, we see the disk of the sun. Please imagine that you can fit 109 Earths across that diameter of the sun. And that translates to over 1 million Earths can fit inside the sun. Just, that is a, just to put into to context, it is a truly massive object, our sun. However, we uh, astronomers classify our sun as a dwarf star. It is a yellow dwarf. However, that term dwarf does not uh, demean the sun at all because uh, it is slightly above average in mass and size. So that means of all the stars in our, in our galaxy and stars in the universe, our, our so-called dwarf star is slightly above average in uh, size and mass, and that means that there are more stars less massive and smaller than the sun than there are stars which are more massive and bigger than our sun. So our star, although we call it a dwarf star, it is nevertheless above average in mass and size. It is almost a perfect sphere. With periods of rotation of 25 to 35 days. And this tells astronomers that the sun cannot be a solid object, not like the Earth, because whether you're on the Earth, whether you're standing on the equator or standing one foot from the South Pole, you'll still take one day to complete one rotation of the Earth, and that is relative to the, uh, the stars. The, the, um, the sun 
As a star, as a ball of gas, has different periods of rotation, at roughly 25 days at the equator and 35 days at the poles. Well, here's a big number, uh, 2 by 10 to the 30. So that's 2 with 30 zeros after it. A massive number, that's, well, a big number. But into context, it's about 1 million Earth masses. Okay, so 1 million Earths will fit inside the sun, and the sun is about 1 million Earth masses. By mass, the sun is about 3 quarters hydrogen and about a quarter helium. And the little bit left over is all the other elements like the oxygen, the carbon, the magnesium, the iron and calcium that, uh, that we are made of comprise the tiny little uh, bit left of that 100%. So that's what, what uh, the earth and what we are made of, the oxygen, carbon, magnesium, calcium, iron, etc. A prodigious energy output, 3.8 by 10 to the 26 watts. So that's uh, a watt is one joule per second. So every second, the sun is giving out 3.8 by 10 to the 26 joules of energy. And because that's radiating in a spherical output, and the Earth is a relatively small target for that energy, so roughly uh, 1,000 watts per square meter of the sun's energy um, hits the Earth's surface. And 1,000 watts is about the amount of energy that a, a good microwave oven will give out um, as we're cooking our food. So that's free energy, ladies and gentlemen. 1,000 watts on average for every square meter of the Earth's surface is uh, solar energy uh, input to the Earth. Now, although the sun doesn't have a surface, the, the brilliant um, blinding uh, um, surface of the sun uh, that we do see is called the photosphere, and its temperature is about five and a half thousand Kelvin, fairly yeah. average. For uh, Russell, yes, we have a we have a question here. I've Already, oh, excellent. Yes, excellent. And Christine Little wants to know how do they calculate all these weights and sizes? Well, well, that's a very, very, a very, very good question, and um, it can be done by determining uh, the distances of the planets from the sun and uh, how long these. Uh, planets take to orbit the sun. And uh, with a, a couple of assumptions thrown in, one uh, can therefore work out the, uh, the mass of the sun uh, required in order for that planet to orbit at that particular speed uh, from that distance from the, uh, uh, from the sun. So that's a very, very good question. There we so, go. Thank uh, you, hopefully, Christine. Uh, hopefully that's the answer to you. So the... Uh, the so-called visible uh, surface of the sun, the so-called photosphere, that dazzlingly bright surface that we shouldn't look at without proper protection, is about five and a half thousand uh, Kelvin. Pretty hot by uh, human standards, but there are uh, stars out there which have uh, surfaces which are far hotter. And how do we know what the sun is made of? Very good question. We know by observing and, and interpreting what we call the solar spectrum. So we take the sun, sun's light and we pass it through a, a prism or something that splits the sun's light into colors. And uh, whenever we see a rainbow in the sky, that, that is raindrops splitting the sun's light into its various colors from red all the way through to uh, indigo. And if, um, if the drops of rain could split the sun's light into um, a wider uh, volume or area of the sky, we might see some uh, very interesting features of it. But however, we have a look. Uh, we can split sun's, uh, sunlight through a special uh, thing called a prism and analyze the, uh, the sun's light. And this is what we see. We see colors all the way from the deepest of red through to orange, to yellow, to green. So sort of a bluey green to blue to uh, indigo and the deepest of violet here. Now, as we can see here, this solar spectrum is split into various strips. So we'll start at the top right hand corner here and we have a strip of solar spectrum that just goes uh, across the top of the page like that. So we get to the very left. Now we go to the next strip below it and we 
so therefore the uh, the top left of the uh, strip above it we join to the the right hand side of this strip so we uh, we we now have a uh, spectrum which is twice as long and we do that do that uh, subsequently for each successive strip and if we do that uh, we'll end up with a spectrum which is about 15 meters long obviously uh, a very um, difficult thing to work with a spectrum 15 meters long but this is a very if efficient way of compacting that very long high resolution spectrum into one easy picture but you'll notice the colors aren't continuous are they ladies and gentlemen the uh, the colors are broken up with um, wider or narrower black lines and these lines are uh, indicative or indicate the particular chemical elements and the, the state of uh, electronic excitation that these particular elements have on the sun. So the sun's light has shone through a slightly cooler region of the sun, just above it, and the elements that are in that slightly cooler region absorb the sun's light. And when that sun's light reaches the earth, the, um, the sun's light has got uh, particular wavelengths which have been absorbed, have been taken out of it. And each of those, each of these many, many hundreds of lines here can be, uh, can be um, attributed to a chemical element in a particular state of electronic excitation. Now, here's an important uh, line up here. This line here is at 656 nanometers. So that's the light of hydrogen. We call that hydrogen alpha. And this is the particular wavelength of hydrogen that the Astronomical Society of Victoria's Hydrogen Alpha Telescope selects out here, the line of hydrogen alpha. So that tells us that uh, the sun contains hydrogen. We already surmised that. But please, believe it or not, it, it wasn't. It was in the 20th century that uh, it was only um, understood that the sun is predominantly made of hydrogen. So we've learned a lot in the past 100 years. We get into the yellowy orange here, and we see this line here and this line here. So those two lines are the sodium doublet. So those two lines, when we see that in the spectrum, that means that 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 light, um, that, well, in this case, the sun contains sodium, one of the constituents of uh, table salt. Coming into the bluey green region, we've got this triplet, this line here, this line here, and this line here that corresponds to magnesium, and so on. So by analyzing the solar spectrum, we know what the sun contains, and the intensities of the lines help uh, astronomers, scientists, to determine how much of that particular element is contained in uh, the sun. Now, hopefully, one other thing you'll notice that when we get into the bluey violet indigo region, we get lots and lots more uh, lines. That's because the light, uh, the blue light, is more energetic than red light, and therefore the blue light has got more energy with which to ionize or excite electrons in the particular elements that are present. All so, right, so, uh, Russell, we have a question. Why are those parts black? What causes them to be black? That's because those wavelengths of light have been removed. They've it's essentially been, been blocked, haven't they? They've been blocked, correct, yes. So, uh, so this is a fingerprint of our sun, and every star will have its own uh, fingerprint of, um, of colours and, uh, and bits of uh, light which have been taken out from which we can uh, provide a fingerprint for that particular star's composition. Well, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how does it shine? Oh, like I'm itching to get these solar videos going as well, but please, I think it's very, very important for us to appreciate what we're looking at and just appreciate some of the properties of what we're looking at just to <laughs> en enhance our, um, our, our joy of, uh, obs of observation of being scientists. So how does the sun shine? Well, it, the sun is a huge nuclear fusion reactor that produces energy as a byproduct of converting hydrogen, which is the simplest chemical element, into helium, which is the, the next simplest element 
of the periodic table in its core. So all this action occurs deep within the sun, right at the center of the sun, which we call the core of the sun. And the conditions in the core are extreme. Temperature is 15 million degrees Kelvin. The density is 162 grams per cubic centimeter. Now, bear in mind the density of water is one gram per cubic centimeter. So the density uh, in the sun's core is 162 times that of water or eight times the density of gold. These are, um, these are unbelievable conditions in the core of our sun. But these are conditions which are required for hydrogen to fuse into helium. And we'll see a video of this uh, later on if time uh, uh, is available. Now, here's a pretty astonishing thing that every second in the core of our sun, four million tons of matter are converted into energy. That's not four million tons of hydrogen is converted into helium in the core. No, that's four million tons of matter are converted into energy every second. A prodigious amount of matter being destroyed, converted into energy. And the sun's been doing that for how many billion, uh, how many million years has the sun been around? 4,600 million years. That's a lot of seconds, ladies and gentlemen. Multiply that by 4 million tons, and that's a lot of mass that the sun has lost. But we've learned that the sun is very massive to start off with, so it can afford to be losing that mass every second. And the energy produced uh, generates an outward pressure that balances gravity's inward, direct, uh, inward directed crush. Gravity is trying to crush the sun out of existence, but to counteract that, physics dictates or forces the sun to fuse hydrogen into helium to provide uh, an outward pressure that, that perfectly balances gravity's inwards directed crush. And hence our, our sun, our star, and other stars in the sky are very finely balanced by these two uh, outward um, opposing forces. So here's an amazing thing that uh, every, every little particle of light, which we call a photon, that is produced in the core of the sun takes many thousands of years to reach the surface. So, this, so the light and its beautiful blue sky outside uh, Elwood at the moment where I am. So, so that sunlight that we're seeing right now, it was produced in the sun thousands upon thousands of years ago in its core, and it's only taken uh, that amount of time to actually get to the radiating surface. Phenomenal. But then once the light reaches the radiating surface, the photosphere, it takes eight minutes and 20 seconds for that light to reach the Earth. So that light that we're seeing now, uh, it took eight minutes and 20 seconds uh, to reach us from the sun. And the sun will keep shining for another five billion years or so. Think about that. It's about halfway through its lifetime. So here's our solar telescope all set up. We've got it pointing at the sun and uh, we've got the, uh, the video camera going and the laptops on, etc., etc. Let's have a look at the sun. So just the question mark, can you, uh, can no, you see that? No, we can't, we can't oh, see really? that. You might have to share that particular video that you've right. got loaded. Yeah. Okie dokie. You might need to share that one separately. Okie dokie. So I'll, uh, I shall stop sharing and go to, here we are, share screen again. Yep. Share screen. While you're doing that, Russ, yep. we have a question from a seven-year-old. How did the sun awesome. form? How did it form? Well, that is a, absolutely a very, very good question. Very, very good question uh, to ask. Um, I can say that there was no one around at the time to see how the, the sun formed, but astronomers looking into the sky can see other stars um, forming before our eyes. And um, so we believe the sun formed uh, similarly. So just imagine this big cloud of gas and dust minding its own business. And um, for whatever reason, uh, that, little, that cloud of gas and dust um, received a, a little bit of a push 
from something like perhaps a star had blown up in the vicinity and that, that pushed the gas and dust together. And when that happens, that gas and dust starts to, under gravity, starts to pull itself together. And if there's an, uh, a large enough amount of gas and dust, that, uh, that inward, uh, that gravity will, uh, will collect more gas and dust together and ultimately will form a star. And then the nuclear processes will take place and we will see that star shining in, uh, in our Milky Way or in, in the universe. So uh, it all requires a little bit of external help for these clouds of gas and dust, which we call nebulae. And you can see them in telescopes or beautiful pictures of them. So that we might actually be able to look at some of those tonight, Russ. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yep, there we are. Oh, live stream some nebulae tonight. Yep. So, um, and that's a beautiful question. So hopefully you can have a look tonight and you can have a look at some of these nebulae. You won't actually be seeing any stars forming within them, but you will see stars that have formed within these uh, nebulae. So that'll be a great treat for you. So the sun yeah. formed from a cloud of gas and dust that received a, a push from something else and uh, the, our sun and the solar system um, is the result. Okay, so I'll, I'll share this and uh, yep. let's see how we go. Can we see uh, a sun on well, the screen? Let's, let's get that going. There it is. I'm going to make that full screen. I'm going to hide us for the moment so everyone can see Probably that. Too. So I'll start the video my end. Yes. So this is a view of, our, of the sun through the sol, uh, ASV solar telescope using that black and white video camera. So this is a video... Uh, just taken a what uh, on the 23rd of September, just a few days ago. Three days sun. ago, when yep. we didn't have so many rain clouds around. Correct. Well, in fact, uh, I was getting a few rain clouds coming through, but I was able to put a cover over the telescope and stop the, uh, the <laughs> rain falling on. So we so have another about... question for you, Russell, while you're going hey. through this one. We have another question. How do you determine the life of the sun? Well, these are excellent questions. Gee, and... Um, well, that's a, that's a very good question, and um, uh, it, it all stems from uh, the from looking at uh, other stars, uh, determining the mass of those stars, and uh, astronomers know that uh, the lifetime of a star depends critically upon how much mass, how much stuff that uh, star has, and it's uh, a little bit hard to appreciate that a star that is born with lots of mass has a shorter lifetime than a star that is born with less mass. So imagine a, uh, a uh, so our sun will live for about 10,000 million years because it has one solar mass, one, one equivalent of mass, but a star that is born with 10 times the mass of the sun may only live for about 1 billion years, for example. So it'll have ten, uh, only one-tenth the lifetime. But how do we determine the mass of the sun? Well, for instance, how do we know how old the sun is? Well, we can do that by measuring the um, elements contained in rocks on the Earth and by measuring the uh, elements contained in uh, radioactive elements contained in rocks on the Earth, we can determine an upper limit to how old the Earth is. And we know that the Earth formed relatively soon after the sun was produced. And uh, so the oldest rocks determined on the Earth are about 4,500 million years old. And from that, we can basically uh, estimate that the sun is about the same age as that, perhaps just slightly longer. And, uh, well, <laughs> that's about all I could say. There we go. <laughs> So, so with this, this, that take, this image is taken helps. through through our um, solar scope, um, but we have a question from Matt Horn here. How Hello, does the, how does the ASV solar telescope compare with the uh, with one at the heliograph at the Old Melbourne Telescope site? Right. Well, that's a very very good question. Hey, you know all about that telescope, don't you? Russ? I do. I do indeed. And um, well, look, the ASV solar scope is a modern solar scope specifically designed for solar viewing. The photoheliograph at the Melbourne Observatory, well, it was built there in 1874. So it's over 140 years old. 
And the photoheliograph was designed to take photos of the sun in white light. So the photoheliograph, as designed, wouldn't um, wouldn't show this uh, this mottling that we see uh, through uh, on the uh, on the present image here. The photoheliograph is great for uh, photographing sunspots, um, and that's about it because that's all it that's all it could actually see. Uh, the sun in white light. We are seeing the sun in the special light of hydrogen here in the ASV's solar telescope, so we're seeing a lot more detail on it. So um, perhaps I should just go through this. So all this light and shade here, that's uh, that's produced by very slight uh, changes in temperature in the sun's, this region of the sun we're looking at, which is the sun's, what we call the sun's chromosphere. The red belt, the red um, shell of um, of the sun that is uh, that is blindingly overwhelmed by the light from the photosphere, a layer of uh, sun about a uh, little bit below it. So all this stuff we see here is actual structure in the sun's chromosphere. Up at the top here is a lighter area which we call an active region. So this is where. Uh, uh, some uh, energy uh, which has been stored inside the sun is is being uh, um, being converted into heat, which is causing a slightly brighter, hotter region, which we call an active region here. Over here, we see this slightly darker area, uh, which we call a filament. Now, um, one thing that we can't see at the moment around the sun are these well, people call them flames. These these jets or these uh, bits of hot uh, sun, which we call, which are more correctly called prominences. Okay, they because they are, they are prominent around the edge of the sun. But no, we can't see any prominences around the edge of the sun here, because prominences are in general um, much much fainter than the, uh, the visible part of the sun. So. In fact, uh, we'll have to uh, increase the, the gain on the camera in order to see the prominences, and I'll uh, do that in a demonstration coming up. So, so what can we, we see? We have another question. Um, Very excellent. Robert. Right. So Matt, again, wants to know where is the sun in its 22-year cycle? Near oh, very, very good. And that's excellent, Matt, and I'm, I'm getting to that. Um, so that 22-year cycle, and very, very good that you know that, is broken into two 11-year cycles. And the sun is pretty much at the bottom of one of these 11-year cycles, a period which is called solar minimum. And it means that we don't see many sunspots on the sun, these uh, dark areas, and we don't see many prominences around the edge of the sun. And what prominences are there tend to be quite small and relatively faint. So they don't show up so well, but we will see some prominences, and I'll uh, I'll be getting onto that. So uh, so there's our sun. So this would be a typical view of the sun that we would see today. All right. Okay. This uh, this active region because the sun uh, rotates. This active region will be about here because my orientation of the sun is a bit mucked up. But that active region will be about here on the sun today. Okie dokie. I'll close that down and uh, have to get back to share another screen. While you're doing it, while you're sharing your screen, um, yep. Michelle wants to know do you think there will be another sun after this one's lifetime? These are excellent questions, and undoubtedly there will be because. Uh, because the sun contains stuff uh, um, in addition to hydrogen and helium, hydrogen and helium being the uh, the two elements that were made uh, in uh, abundance when the universe uh, first formed in the in the Big Bang. But we know that the uh, the sun contains heavier elements, as I've indicated, calcium and oxygen and carbon and and the and iron and stuff like that. These are elements that stars make in their cores during their normal lifetimes. And so therefore, the we know that the sun is made from stuff that has already been processed in 
previous stars, which may have uh, exploded as supernovae. So um, astrophysicists believe that our sun is a third generation star, meaning that it contains stuff that had been processed in two previous generations of stars. So in 5,000 million years or so, when the sun ends its life, it will have puffed, out, and I'm sorry, I'm using some hand gestures here that you can't <laughs> see, but the sun will have, have puffed out its outer layers, not exploded them out, but just puffed them out, and all that's predominantly, uh, probably, uh, what, 80% of the sun will have just been wafted into the, uh, into the universe, which will uh, still contain lots of hydrogen and some helium and will contain all the other elements that the sun has uh, also made. And uh, that's, that material will uh, be available for another generation of stars to be produced. So, uh, so when the sun eventually dies, that will not be the end of, of the sun. It's... Uh, its material will be uh, utilized in the next generation of stars. So it's, oh, a, we go. it's an ongoing story there. Um, okay, so uh, I have another video here. You might have to share this one separately I as well, right? Yes, yeah. I will so indeed. That's all right. And here we go. While you're getting that one, someone has been asking yep. about the, uh, so Grace here has been asking, but what causes the cycle? So, um, some of the guys from our team have answered about the solar cycle effects uh, from sunspots and magnetic fields and mag magnetic fields change, but what actually causes the cycle? Once again, a, a fabulous question, and the short answer is uh, astronomers don't know. There we go. <laughs> it's, um, Can't so much about the sun. There is so much about the sun that is yet to be discovered, and, of course, we can't take... We can't go to the sun and take samples of it. We can't uh, look in, into the inner workings of the sun because they're hidden from us. But we do know that the sun is a huge magnet and we do know that the solar cycle is a magnetic cycle. So therefore, uh, the, uh, the solar cycle is all to do with how the sun's internal magnetism and the flows of plasma inside the sun all work together to create this uh, change in solar activity over uh, an 11 year cycle. There we go. What, something cool. else I can say is that we have, uh, well, I want to say we, I mean solar scientists or uh, <laughs> astrophysicists. And sorry, I do use the word we, uh, but um, we, we do know that um, when we look at other stars, other stars show uh, cycles of activity as well, magnetic cycles. Because believe it or not, by analysing starlight, we can actually see the effects of magnetism on the, uh, the the spectra of these stars, and the spectra change very subtly over periods of years. And uh, so, other stars have their own cycles as well, not necessarily eleven years, but they could be five years or twenty years. So uh, we're starting to learn that the sun's eleven-year cycle is not unique; that other stars have similar cycles of uh, magnetic uh, activity which is always good to know All okay right, so, so we'll share this one yep hopefully you got. yes yeah let's make that full screen Are you sure we? We, Mark? can you see that yes we can, can. yeah perfect yep excellent so for this so for this video i've turned up the camera again quite a lot and that's really overexposed the uh, the sun um, the, the disk of the sun, but if you look up the top here, there's a little prominence coming out. Can you see that up the top here? If you look really very carefully, there's some faint prominences around the edge here as well. So they look quite small compared to the sun, but please remember 109 Earths will fit across the diameter of the sun. So this little prominence here could probably fit two or three Earths in it, just to give you a, a perspective, all right? So I am, and all the, and the members of the solar section, and hopefully a lot of members of the ASV are looking forward to when the sun comes out of its uh, minimum activity and starts becoming more active, because these prominences are going to be much bigger and much brighter, and uh, the edge of the sun will be festooned with uh, prominences. And uh, that'll make for a fantastic uh, demonstration 
So we're talking of prominence, yeah. prominence, Russell, we have a, a, um, uh, one of our members in uh, Brazil, uh, mm. Sergio, has messaged us and asked us a question. Uh, he said he saw some pictures of the sun and saw arcs of energy, arcs yeah. that were going from one spot to another. What are those? Well, well is that Sergio? It is, that, yes. Sergio. Hola, yes. Sergio. So... Um, so we, we will learn later on in the video that, uh, that sunspots are caused by uh, magnetic fields coming out of the sun, going into space and coming back into the sun. And that will create two sunspots. And it is a, a, a fact of life, uh, well, uh, and of um, sort of plasma physics that, uh, that ionized gas, i.e. plasma, have to follow those magnetic lines of force. So, so those curves are actually indicative of the, uh, the magnetic field uh, coming out of the sun. Uh, so those loops are loops of magnetic field that the, the plasma is having to follow because of, uh, of physics. And so those, those loops, etc., cetera, actually um, show us the magnetic lines of force coming out of the sun and going back in. And there will be some a wonderful uh, video of this coming up as well. So another excellent question. So there's our sun, um, overexposed, but deliberately done so just to show the, uh, the small number of prominences, and that's the, uh, the most significant one today. But I'll uh, just keep playing it because this is what we would, we would be suffering today, the clouds <laughs> coming through. Just when we're getting a good view of the sun, those pesky old clouds come through. But you'll notice... When thin cloud comes through, you'll you'll start to see the uh, the disk of the sun properly exposed, and you see some structure there. So I mean that structure is still there. It's just that the uh, the camera is overexposing it, and uh, we don't see it in this particular view. So that's what we would be seeing today, ladies and gentlemen. Look at that. A frustrating day. <laughs> Okie dokie. Oh, this is this is really good. Look, I hope uh, I'm certainly enjoying it. <laughs> well, I'm I hope sure. everyone I'm else sure. is. There are a lot of questions. The guys are, um, I think Linda and Noel are working in the background answering a lot of questions. So thanks, guys, for doing right. that. And um, I could coming. feed you many, many questions uh, that there is, that there are here. So you know, we've got uh, Shah here wants to know. Uh, as you know, the sun is becoming brighter. Will the sun become too luminous to sustain life on Earth? If so, what's the time frame between Earth for when Earth becomes inhospitable? And is a wonderfully knowledgeable question. Indeed. Indeed. As the sun ages, it does get uh, brighter, more energetic, because it's actually shrinking. Remember, the sun is losing mass, and the, so therefore uh, the sun is, is having to shrink because um, to, to maintain its equilibrium. And when we, uh, when we think back of the sun a billion or two billion years ago, it would have been larger and less uh, luminous and less uh, hot than it is today. So that the sun is slowly evolving over time. And to put a time frame on it, it's probably going to be a couple of billion years from now that the sun will be uh, become um, gradually brighter and hotter that will... Uh, basically uh, mean that the uh, the uh, earth will become uh, uninhabitable the oceans will boil off and uh, that'll be the end of life uh, as we know it so yeah it's not going to happen overnight but it will eventually happen which is which is sad but that's just the way things go so hopefully that answers the question so ladies and gentlemen so this image we see on the screen here is uh, an image that was uh, collected from the, the video that was taken. And there are some wonderful programs out there that uh, will, will take a video. And please bear in mind that a video is just a collection of still frames added together, added together so quickly that it appears uh, to move to our eyes. So uh, roughly 24, 30, maybe 50 frames per second, each of those frames being a still. And um, although we didn't uh, see it uh, particularly well in the, in the wide view of the sun, uh, uh, the Earth's atmosphere affects the clarity of, uh, of astronomical objects. It creates turbulence and it, it blurs uh, features on the sun but, uh, or, or planets or, um, or stars or whatever when we're looking through the Earth's atmosphere. But taking a video, it means that 
quite a few uh, shots per second will be taken during a time when the atmosphere is particularly still. That program can select those sharpest images and stack them up to improve the, uh, the signal to noise ratio and to make the features far more uh, prominent to see. So here is that, that uh, video processed. Uh, the, the sharpest frames were, uh, were stacked up. And uh, so you can see the, uh, the features on the sun in uh, greater contrast. And that's what astronomy is all about, ladies and gentlemen, actually, is contrast, the difference between the light and the shade and how uh, easy it is to see those differences. But still, no prominences around the edge. Very quiet at the moment. Very much so. OK, well, um, let's zoom in. So that's a feature of the video. I can I can see that the the uh, full disk of the sun, but I can zoom in on a region of the sun and uh, and basically have a closer look at uh, features on the sun. So we'll we'll do that now. We'll have to do the same thing. Right? We'll have to do the yes, stop share and then yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting there. We'll stop sharing that and. All right. uh, so I'll also, everyone's still with us. They this are. Is. We've got about 145 people across the two yeah. platforms tuning in. So you've, you've Come got on. A lot of watching. We've got tell about... Your, tell your friends and your family. Come on, <laughs> join in. Let's get more. Come on. We've got uh, about 10 minutes left, but we can probably push another 10. Oh, so you crikey, have we? 20 minutes. We've been it's going true. for 50 minutes, Russ. But we pro we'll squeeze it out another 20. How's that? Oh, please do, because the best is yet to come. I know. So, <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, I've I've just selected uh, a part of the sun uh, that has that active region, and you now you'll see the uh, effect of the Earth's atmospheric turbulence affecting the uh, the clarity of the view. So the sun is moving around, and it's it's getting fuzzy, and it's becoming sharp. That's all because of the the sun uh, because of the Earth's atmosphere affecting, and really. Because we are photographing during the day when the sun's energy is being absorbed by the earth, so hot air rises up and creates this turbulence that we're seeing through. But isn't that a wonderful shot of, uh, of the sun? Now, if you look very carefully, just up here, there's that prominence that we saw. Hopefully you can see that yes. in that active region. I might now, I should actually... For us. I should point out, ladies and gentlemen, that these this light and shade here is not only differences in temperature, but slightly uh, di slight differences in height as well. These light areas can be considered as slightly hotter gas being less dense as rising up, because we know that uh, hot uh, well hot air rises, and we can consider hot uh, sun material rising up. As it rises up, it cools down slightly, becomes denser, and wants to it wants to move downwards. So we can consider this as a bit like a conveyor belt of hot solar stuff rising up, cooling down, and then the darker areas are now slightly cooler, so they're going back downwards. And we will see that in the next shot when I have taken this video and processed it to show a single image of the sun. And that's the other beauty of the sun of the ASV solar telescope. We we have a zoom eyepiece on it, so we can zoom in on these regions as well. We'll stop yeah. sharing that. That's all right. Did you want to get the close up video loaded? That was the close up. No, no, the oh sorry, your other one that you were talking about. The other one, right. Um, let's share screen. And uh, this is fun. <laughs> it is, isn't it? We'll share that. And there we are. And here we go. There we are. So that's that same uh, view of the sun processed. So there's the active region with lots of detail around it. And you see that uh, there's actually structure around the active region, no curved uh, features, uh, features rising up. There's our prominence, and this is and look at the number of uh, rough bits on the edge of the sun, for want of a better word. These are all actual the edge of the sun, real features on the edge of the sun. There's a little uh, 
a little curved prominence here and another one over here. And you can see that there's some, some sun stuff that's a little bit higher up than other bits. So these correspond to the, the lighter parts of the sun, which have risen up and they'll eventually fall down. I've lost my mouse, there we go. So that fe these features on the edge of the sun are real features, as are all these features here as well. Beautiful stuff. Wonderful. So let's move on. Crikey. Well, I think I better uh, move on, but um, I think we are all looking forward to seeing the sun like this with lots of sunspots on there, ladies and gentlemen, because sunspots equal solar activity, which equal explosions on the sun, which equals stuff, solar stuff getting blasted into space. <laughs> as, long as, much, not, as long as it's not coming to <laughs> Very exciting. Now, a learned gentleman there mentioned the sun's 11-year sun's cycle. So here, here is the sun's 11-year cycle shown very, very clearly by measuring the number of sunspots visible on the sun from day to day. So that's, we can put a number to that. And here's the, the, the time from 1880 to 2000. You can see that the sun's activity is measured in sunspots is uh, oscillating solar maximum, solar minimum, solar maximum in roughly 11 years, okay? So not only is that 11 years approximate, because look here, uh, that's slightly less than 11 years, but also the uh, intensity of the solar maxima are changing over time as well. So, this, and this is just by measuring, uh, observing sunspots on the sun, a very easily done uh, feature of solar observation. But what about 2000 to now? Well, this is something I, I do just as a personal thing for uh, my solar observation. I go to spaceweather.com, a NASA site, which each day gives a sunspot number. I put that into an Excel spreadsheet, and I've been doing that since 2010. Frankly, that's over 10 years now. <laughs> and you come up with a plot like this. Well, where, uh, we, yeah? we, have, we have a description of you from one of the uh, viewers, Ricky. Uh, has said that you are a solar beast, and this, I think, is evidence of that. I love it. But really, I'm, I'm such a quiet and um, unassuming guy. <laughs> but anyway. And I think that's because Neil's got it right. Your enthusiasm is solar-powered. Mm, exactly, yes. Well, we have tracks flying out everywhere at the moment. Well, remember, ladies and gentlemen, that the, the food that we eat and the, all the carbohydrates comes from photosynthesis, which is sunlight converted... Sun, solar energy converted into chemical energy, and that's what keeps us going. We're nothing so, without. Um, so here's solar maximum, which uh, occurred around about well 2014. There we go, early 2014, and then there's a steady de uh, decline in sunspot number, which we equate to solar activity. And now we're uh, in the depths of solar minimum. If I can get my uh, cursor back, there we are. And it would appear that the sun is a little bit of an upshot, uh, up, uptick in solar activity. And in fact, the, the NASA solar scientists have said that the, uh, the solar minimum, the sun did reach minimum in about December last year, December 2019. And that means that it's going to slowly come out of, uh, of minimum. And really, this data tends to uh, agree with that uh, very, very much indeed. So uh, over the next uh, two, three, four years, the sun will uh, activity will steadily rise, and we will see more sunspots, more solar activity, and that will lead on to some very interesting things. Let's let's move along, please. Whoa! While you're so moving the along, today, while Pardon? you're moving along, while you're moving along, Grace yes. has uh, asked another question. Do, do sunspots harm us? What was the question? Sorry. Do sunspots harm us? Not, not directly, but the, or because sunspots are an indication of stored energy, magnetic energy, uh, they, they can harm us indirectly. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pretty much finish off my talk with um, some of the impacts of solar activity on us. Some good impacts and some, uh, some not so good impacts. So there we are. Here's the, um, the sun lots of uh, sunspots. And uh, what I'll show here is a beautiful video that NASA has put together 
of we might, we might need to do the stop share and then share that video exactly yep looks like those inbuilt links don't um, that's don't right no worries. <laughs> no worries i'm happy to, right. to and while you're loading loading that um yep. why is it a 27 day moving average or why is it a 25 to 35 day moving average well that's that is excellent ladies and gentlemen for actually paying attention that's because the uh, it takes about 27 days for the equator of the sun to rotate so basically that's sort of averaged out over one solar rotation okay so that's a that's a one way of getting getting the uh, the, the the peaks and the troughs uh, from a day to day basis uh, averaged out over uh, over time Wonderful. otherwise it would be just a, a picket fence of of um of lines anyway but but a very very good question so here okay. we go now crikey i, I might have to uh, tick that box again <laughs> did you remember to tick the box well, I didn't this time no uh, <laughs> share screen yep and share audio here we go and uh, go up here to this and ladies and gentlemen all this stuff is free on the nasa website hopefully you can hear the sound so enjoy a vu i don't think we've got any sound russ oh. Bother. Uh, but, uh, does, is it, does it matter? I mean, we can no. see the beautiful images, so I think maybe we'll just watch it's the images. A, it's a beautiful piece of uh, music. Yeah. But uh, what, no, what we images. might do is um, I'll get this link from you and we'll put this on our Facebook page so that people can maybe hear the beautiful right. music. But we don't need the music right now, so we can just okay. sit and watch. So while we're watching now, this... And, right, uh, sorry, Mark, but can everyone else hear me? Yes, they can hear. Oh, they yeah, can. they can hear you. Yep. yep. So there is no sound, but it's just music, guys. So yeah. But the the music is quite lovely. It just adds that extra uh, dimension to it. Now you'll see some images of the sun in different colours. So these different colours just represent the different wavelengths that the uh, images are being taken in. All right. So it's uh, it's not true colour. It is just a uh, a different. Um, wavelength of light and, and lots of these wavelengths of light are uh, in the ultraviolet wavelengths that we can't see but uh, it's true in astronomy that every different kind of color that we observe the universe is and we see the universe in a different light okay so oh that is beautiful isn't it yep. our own star okay so while that's we're watching planet, this, that's planet Venus. That is Venus moving across. So, what is the explanation of our planet being the only one that sustains life in such intricacy? Well, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We don't know about that. Um, we don't know enough about other stars, but we do know that pretty much every star that we see in the nighttime sky will have planets orbiting it or or planets in um being formed so it's I, I it's incredible video, i think your video has stopped playing there russ uh, i've switched it off yes oh okay right yeah, so yeah um, it is will, hard um, to believe that it's hard to believe that uh, we we are the only intelligent uh, life forms in the universe hard to believe that but oh. Are we, we are the only right? ones that we know of at first. So there's the loop they're showing the magnetic structures of the sun. So there's a flare, an explosion on the sun. These white areas we would call active areas, which we would see as sunspot on the sun through our telescopes. 
There's a flare, a uh, dramatic release of magnetic energy. These are magnetic loop. And ladies and gentlemen, we would see these through our uh, ASB solar telescope with our own eyes. Our sunspots change structure over time. Another flare. It's More a magnetic loop. A beautiful yep. video, Russell. Absolutely yes. beautiful. That's our star. Most magnificent object. And if only you could hear the dramatic music. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we, we will share the link for this uh, yep. on our Facebook page so everyone will be able to listen to it uh, with the dramatic music. There's uh, so the, uh, planet Venus again. So this would have been 2012. So Russ, yes, I want to. Shannon wants to know what is the true color of the sun because we're seeing lots of different colors in this video. Sorry, what was the question again? What is the true color of the sun? A, a beautiful question. Well, the, the true color is yellow, yellowy green. So a similar color to that, a yellowy green color, and that's simply because that is the uh, the color of light that the sun uh, radiates in greatest amount. Okay, it radiates blue light and it radiates red light as well, but the uh, the sun predominantly shines uh, in a yellowish light. We say the sun is a yellow dwarf. Oh, Russ, we have a question from our uh, radio astronomy section director. Oh, gosh, that means I'm going to be, uh, <laughs> might be struggling here. Anyway. We would like to know if these videos were filmed in real time or sped up for illustration. Well, bearing in mind that was five years of, um, of images uh, taken at various times. So in general, the uh, videos are sped up, yes. Um, Although activity on the sun can occur quite quickly when we look at it up close, uh, in general, it probably takes an hour or, or so for, for structures to become um, visibly changed. But nevertheless, uh, looking through the solar ASV solar telescope over a period of a couple of hours, looking at a prominence, you will see it change its shape and its structure over that time. So uh, just to give you an idea of uh, timescales involved. Okay, so um, we're running a little bit over time here at the moment, Russ. Did you did okay. you want me to share one of those videos of Belinda's? Yes, Show please. Everybody. You wouldn't so, mind doing that. Thanks. Would you, would you like to give a bit of an explanation about what we're going yeah. to watch? Yes, and uh, hopefully uh, Belinda has joined in. Now, uh, I hope Belinda won't... Uh, Belinda is an ASV member who um, hopefully she won't mind me... Uh, saying that she's a bit of an aurora chaser. Now, aurorae are a, a visible indication of solar activity because when the sun is active, we tend to see more aurorae, stronger aurorae, and even aurorae visible from Melbourne, for example, or southern Australia. So another reason to look forward to uh, an increase in solar activity. So... Um, and uh, Belinda has been to Norway and uh, to Canada on two different trips to specifically, well, A, enjoy the, uh, a foreign country, but also to have the opportunity of uh, seeing the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. So, uh, so this right, is some of Belinda's work and it's award-winning work from uh, Belinda, an ASV member. Should we go okay. Norway or? Let's go one. to Canada. Let's go to Canada, I Canada. think. Yes. Okay. Canada it is. And it's beautiful work. Now, can, I just want to make sure that everyone can see this when I make it large. Are we able to see what we can see right now? Russ, can you see well, this um, video? 
Um, I can see. Oh, beautiful. It's it's working. This is good. Working. Okay. Right. So let's go back to that and let's hit play. Russ, I've got to do a, a mic drop on on the um, sound working, mate. That was uh, finally got that one sorted. <laughs> right on. So um, you heard the you heard the soundtrack. Everyone heard the audio as well. Oh, so that, the that's Belinda as well. Belinda's music going yeah, with it. Yes, so, and that is her music as well. Um, so we, we are going to have to wrap it up because we've got eighteen minutes until um, I have to be back here for the junior um, right. presentation, okay. which is. A presentation. Um, hang on, let's just stop that for a second. Oh, let's close those ones down. I've got extra noise in the background there. Um, so we're back in about 18 minutes for the junior presentation where uh, we have Sadie is going to be doing a presentation on how galaxies are formed. Um, so Sadie is a seven year old uh, ASV junior member, um, just so happens to be my daughter. So she's going to do a presentation that she's put together uh, with a little bit of help from me. She originally did that presentation mm. for her school, for her class, mm. and we expanded upon it a little bit. Um, and so thank you, everybody, for coming along. Thank you, Russell, for your wonderful presentation and your enthusiasm. And uh, I'll see everyone back here in about 18 minutes' time. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. <laughs>